Hello, and welcome to the Outlier Podcast, the podcast for everyone who is interested in building better homes. My name is Anthony, and I am the founder and lead designer of Outlier, and I'm passionate about creating beautiful and high-performing homes. I sit down regularly to chat with industry experts to help educate Australians about the potential of creating healthy, comfortable, and energy-efficient homes. Whether you are looking to build your forever home, renovate your existing house, or simply eager to learn more, tune in every month wherever you get your podcasts. We hope you join us on this journey. I have been very fortunate with the journey of this podcast to chat with many experts and knowledgeable people. As new people come to the podcast every week, we want to take all the highlights and helpful information from previous discussions to provide them to you to assist you with your own high performance home journey. Like that, so boosted rate, would that be, I know personal experience here, typically you'll see that maybe in a bathroom or a toilet where when you put on, you can hit a button like you would typically hit for an exhaust fan and it will go into boost mode for a certain period of time to just increase that air extract, say after you've had a shower, that's, um, that's what you mean by boost mode in that scenario as well or? Correct, yeah. So it's boosted rate. Obviously, the system doesn't have any zoning, so you're boosting whole house extract and flow rates. Um, to introduce that zoning would just add unle- unnecessarily levels of complexity and ultimately not much saving. So in a, in a high-performance um, HRV unit, good duct design, um, so let's call it a 280-square-metre, three-bed house, HRV unit power consumption at the premium end of town is probably about 35 watts. And even at the tier two kind of level, you might be at 40 to maybe 45 watts. So they're they're low energy consumption. So by trying to do this zoning that we might be familiar with heating and cooling, we're introducing componentry cost, points of failure, complexity for extremely little energy benefit. You've mentioned it before, depending on what system you get, there's lower noise that comes with it. How loud are these systems? Is this something that you will hear on an ongoing basis or can you just, yeah, it's just, it's not really an issue, the noise part of it. Yeah. I always love the how loud are they going to be. Noise is a, <laughs> is a pretty challenging topic to uh, quantify for um, for the average kind of user or everyone in general. And so it's important that we start way back at the beginning on system design, appropriate sized HRV selection. So we don't want a unit that's running right up near its peak capacity for too much of the time. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure we've got some attenuation or silencing in that duct system. And we want to make sure we've located the HRV in an appropriate spot too. We don't don't want to go putting it into a walk-in robe uh, behind a master bedroom, for example, yeah. <laughs> we, we want it ideally in a wet area like a laundry. Um, that that kind of makes sense. So, um, yeah, no, noise is a fairly critical thing. I I think for the lay person, it's going to be really difficult to do the effective analysis to understand that. I think you've really got to pick yourself a good reputable supplier of equipment who understands the limitations of each piece of equipment uh, and can, yeah, can provide some explanation if you're really interested in that noise level stuff, can sort of break down, here's the, the unit noise output, here's what our silencer does, so this yeah. is the noise level in the duct work. Um, and ultimately, the last complicating factor is the room furnishings and wall coverings mm. uh, impact perceivable noise so whilst we can give you an exact sound power level at a grill the way it's perceived by the occupant is completely different in a tile bathroom versus a soft furnished lounge room my view is they should be virtually imperceptible when you lay there silently in bed you might hear the slightest little bit of airflow noise but it certainly shouldn't be a, a hum or a loud noise it should be should be yeah, very, very quiet and um, non-intrusive. Yeah. What are the ongoing maintenance uh, requirements for a system um, or even the usability? You know, like how easy is this for me to understand it, use 
the you know uh, the interface and you know what are the ongoing upkeeps required from from our end once you know we've had the keys of the home handed to us. Yeah. So usability is, is is a good question. HRV systems are really designed to sit in the background. Uh, they're not not designed to be. Um, regularly tinkered with or adjusted apart from the use of these boost switches or whatever boosting mechanism is. Some might have an onboard uh, humidity sensor to boost for bathroom use and things like that. So they're designed to sit in the background. You might um, put it into a, a low away mode if you go on holidays. Mm-hmm. And so it's something we've probably not touched on is that there's benefit in having some baseline ventilation in order to um, give yourself some, you're building some condensation protection. Um, the other thing is it's not great to turn your HRV unit off fully for extended periods. Um, there's always a risk that um, you've made that decision to leave after jumping out of the shower uh, and it'll turn your HRV unit off and head off for two weeks and you've actually got some moisture in your ductwork still. Mm-hmm. And as much as that ductwork is really carefully um, designed in terms of materials and construction to be anti mold growth and bacterial, we don't want to invite trouble by having moisture, high moisture levels in that ductwork. So even yeah. that that really low ventilation rate that's costing you ten watts is going to keep your HRV system in really good condition. There, um, in terms of maintenance requirements. Um, So principally, you've got filter changes. And in essence, um, they're there to capture capture all those particles that are outside your home that you don't want in. And it's probably worth delving just for a second into some of the detail. Um, The really good standard um, supply air filtration is what's known as F7. And it's kind of slightly been updated now to an ISO standard, but I don't think mm-hmm. anyone kind of quite speaks that language yet. <laughs> Certainly not remember. So we'll pretend we're in inches instead of centimetres still. Uh, so F7 on supply side, and that will get rid of all those particles down in that kind of two micron size, which are uh, particles that have health implications. There's kind of a, mm-hmm. a particle range there that will get um, through your respiratory system. That's the nasties. Bigger stuff than that gets blocked and caught up in um, various nose hairs and bits and pieces, but there's a danger range in there, so we want to hit those. You'll notice there's two filters. So in a HRV unit, one's catching that outside air we talked about before it becomes supply air. The other one's actually um, catching the extract air or the air that's coming out of your bathroom uh, to your HRV unit, and its job is basically to protect the heat exchanger. So if you generate some internal internal dust particles or lint in your laundry, we don't want that getting up to the HRV unit. Mm -hmm. Uh, And in fact, typically at extract points, we'll also put in some filters because we don't even really want that garbage in the extract ductwork. It's just going to accelerate the cleaning cycle needed. Uh, And so the second part of that obviously is filter changes, sorry, first, and around about six monthly is where you want to budget. at probably five years, you probably want to get a contractor back, pull the front off your unit, pull the HRV core out, give it a bit of a wash. They can go into a warm bath and that sort of stuff just to make sure there's no um, yeah, no buildup of contaminants there. You might wipe out or vac out the fans. Sometimes you can get a little bit of dust accumulation there. Um, you might do an inspection at five years of ductwork just to make sure that visibly it looks okay Uh, but probably somewhere between five and ten years you probably want to think about a duct clean what if people are just 100 percent against mechanical ventilation is there something you usually say (laughs) to convince them otherwise yeah (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. so it's interesting that um five air change per hour threshold that's kind of in the code I guess the first point I'd make out is that or make that is that they've presented that as a fresh air supply requirement. It's got nothing to do with condensation management or um, extract there. So um, we would easily argue that continuous ventilation is probably just or more important on the extract side 
for condensation management purposes at under five air changes, but it's not kind of been structured that way uh, is my understanding. How would we go about convincing um, those who are skeptical of the benefits of um, ventilation and heat recovery ventilation particularly? Uh, the first point I would probably make and the, the important one is you're doing it for indoor air quality and health reasons. So we can also demonstrate some energy savings compared to having your windows open um, in terms of save heating and cooling. Uh, there's definitely comfort compared to open windows, but indoor air quality, guaranteed indoor air quality is principally the thing you're shooting for. And so when people say, look, it's not really worth the cost or it's too expensive, uh, I'm immediately asking the question, exactly how have you valued health? And I I'm not aware of anyone um, globally who's yet got a great answer to how have we valued um, health? I, I know in the US at Berkeley, there's some people who are trying to start to build some models. They're still needing lots of data to go into there and they start talking about extended life years and things like that in relation to indoor air quality and trying to price health. But it's still a pretty abstract kind of model. And so to make a, a cost judgment against indoor air quality to me doesn't make a lot of sense. The other, other scenario I always like is, A, build a little bit smaller. If you want those really good functionality things, you want even want the bench top still, build a little bit yeah. smaller. We've still got a pretty bad habit of building oversized buildings. Um, and also make sure you get the important elements that you can't retrofit easily afterwards. So that's always going to be mm -hmm. building on below. Like get those good quality windows in there, get good levels of insulation. HRV drops into that, that bucket as well. Get that installed. In the really worst instance, get your ductwork in and uh, apply the HRV in it uh, a year later when you've yeah. digested the total construction cost and you've recovered, a, your bank balance has recovered a fraction. Fit it off then. Um, but to yeah, dismiss it on a cost basis doesn't have a lot of logic to me. Um, and, and we see comparison also to heating and cooling air conditioning systems. Like I can get, I can get uh, three installed split systems for the price of that. It's like, well, yeah, they're delivering different kind of outcomes. So to compare the two doesn't make any rational sense. Um, and I'd also suggest that uh, measuring the benefits in a short time frame of indoor air quality is difficult and unless you drop into that um, severely impacted category so if you're immunocompromised or really uh, severe asthma sufferer or um, hay fever sufferer in those instances you'll pick up the, the tangible benefits super quickly but for mm -hmm. the average person, it's probably not something you uh, necessarily mark on a, a daily basis. Um, yeah, so, so it's, it's challenging to even perceive that. But over the longer period, uh, there's definitely demonstrated benefits to better indoor air quality. Yeah, great way to, to kind of bring this episode to an end. Um, yeah, there's no real value you can put on health. So, what what's the best point for people to be able to reach out to you if you want you know to assist? Yeah, so probably via email. Ironically, now <laughs> um, there's a fair volume of um, projects running through the space at the moment, and so emails just a great way for us to store notes and information as we're going. We ultimately want some floor plans from you anyway, so a quick little email. Um, around that um, here, here's my project here's the floor plans that allows us to be a, way more precise in terms of a, an estimate on costs and some of the parameters rather than just um, yeah just a sort of blank email so uh, hrv at fantech.com.au um, fantech's with a t-e-c-h on it uh, is the easy way to get that information um, to you and um, we can obviously respond with a bit of uh, reading information as well Thank you for listening to the Outlier Podcast. 
You can find helpful links and contact information regarding this episode in our show notes and on our website, outlierstudio.com.au forward slash podcast. If you like our show, please leave a review and make sure you subscribe to never miss a new episode. If you have further questions for us or would want to share some additional feedback, please feel free to DM us on Instagram or Facebook. Until next time on the Outlier Podcast.